Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Cube's CXO series in collaboration with NYSC Wired. My name is Dave Vellante, and really excited to have Philip Ratley here. He's the Chief Technology Officer and former Chief Product Officer at Neo. 4J, really interesting native graph data store that is uh, riding the wave of AI. Philip, thanks for coming into the studio here, overlooking the the, the trading floor. It's and, a pleasure uh, to be here. This is where you. it all happens. Amazing, isn't it? Oracle rang the bell today. Uh, interesting. Of course, you know a little bit about database, but um, so let's start with your role and a little bit more on Neo 4J. Sure. So Neo 4J is a company that uh, really helps a lot of the largest companies in the world and lots of startups, companies of all size, help understand connections in their data. So the world is getting more and more connected and it's not enough to just uh, you know, be able to manage your data. You need to do that, store and retrieve and do basic analysis. But if you really want to get to the bottom of you know, what's, what's going on and get better predictive behavior, to get, get to the next level in uh, competitiveness, then understanding your relationships and being able to mine those more deeply um, makes a pretty huge difference. Um, I joined Neo4j in 2012. Uh, was the company was 30 people now, we're 800 plus growing um, and used by uh, many of the world's largest companies. So top 20 other 20 US banks, including JPMC, Citi, UBS and more. Uh, top retailers, three other top aircraft manufacturers, including Lockheed. Uh, it's pretty, quite a broad and a fun space. I, I've always been super excited about graph databases, knowledge graphs, um, the expressiveness that you get from such a system is awesome, frankly, but it's always been hard you, to query. You don't get the query flexibility of say a SQL, right? Yeah. So you have that sort of trade off. So that's why it's been really a, a, a home run in a lot of sort of more narrow use cases, um, like cybersecurity, as an example. Mm -hmm. It's obviously a great uh, a, a use case and application for it. And that's beginning to change. Um, there's an AI tailwind, which almost necessitates that you have these connections and can, yeah. can visualize them. Can you explain a little bit more on the technology and how you're making it more accessible? Yeah, so let's start with the model, because the model, as you point out, is really natural and easy to understand. In the same way that a business person will whiteboard their domain, like circles and lines, and Philip owns this car, which has this VIN and you know, is insured by this insurance company, you can just swivel the chair and put that into the graph. Um, as far as querying, I have some good news for you, David. So this year, ISO, for the first time in 37 years, released a new database query, uh, database language standard, and it is now a sibling to SQL. It's called GQL, and it's called you know graph query language. It right. entirely uh, democratizes graphs. Um, the way that language has been designed is it's very similar to SQL in all the ways that matter, so easy for people to learn. Also very similar to Cypher, which is a, uh, the de facto graph query language that Neo4j opened up um, nearly a decade ago in 2015. So this was super news for the industry because yeah. rather than having a series of, of proprietary query languages, you now have an industry standard. So you get the flexibility of something as simple as SQL that everybody can you know, understand. And you maintain that expressiveness of the, the rep. Now, let's talk about why this is so important in the AI era. Because everybody always says, Philip, you can't have good AI without good data. Yeah. And it's hard to get good data. Uh, the example that I always use is, if, if you, if you want to have like a consistent data, all the data is locked inside of applications and the data, the metadata, the business logic, and it's, it's, it's sort of trapped, if you will. Uh, I've always seen graph as at least a, a path to exposing that, harmonizing that data. And again, the example I use is revenue. What is revenue? Mm -hmm. Could be NRR, could be ARR, could be bookings, could be calendar year, could be fiscal year. And people spend more time arguing about that. Mm -hmm. um, is am I on the right track in terms of the 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 tailwind that AI has provided for your business? And I, I'm really interested in how you're applying it to solve problems. Yeah, uh, I guess there are multiple tailwinds. So one mm. is on the data preparation yep. side, and then one is on the query interacting with AI side, 
Uh, and there's a technique called graph rag, which is retrieval augmented generation using a knowledge graph that uh, has really become a pretty hot uh, trend right now in, inside of AI. Um, but those two things go together. So I was just re-listening yesterday to Sequoia's Training Data podcast, and there's an episode where the CTO of Klarna talks about their internal application and how it's based on Neo4j. Um, and th the reason he talks about, uh, th the value he talks about uh, th that the knowledge graph brings is, it's not just a way to consolidate one's data assets, um, to normalize them, to, to get them correct, but also a way to provide collaboration around people, you know, as, as people use the data, obviously you have the same data in 50 different places if you're a large company and who knows which one is most up to date and correct. And so um, providing a means of exposing that, cleaning it up, curating it, but then using GraphRag as well on top of it. Um, so there's a, uh, and, and the, what we're finding with GraphRag is it also bridges an important gap between human design, like what we as humans want the machines to do um, and what the machines are doing, which otherwise would be an, you know, entirely a black box. Um, you get benefits like, which we can drill down into why of like increased accuracy, um, better answers, higher fidelity, explainability, um, and then uh, governance and governance and explainability on the back backside. But you also get these, um, you know, I, I think zooming out. This provides a good way to bridge what's happening in the broad black box machine realm, and what we humans need in terms of preserving our autonomy of decision making, and then. Uh, as, as well as corralling the AI to do what we want it to do. So the Klarna example is really interesting because essentially they put forth in this podcast that, I mean, the way I would describe it is they're blowing away their whole SaaS model and they're basically replacing. Which you know, I, I don't necessarily <laughs> recommend people go out and do right. that. There's a good and, reason for having packaged software. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure they're going to, yeah. that's not like it's going to happen overnight, but yeah. they are a leader in thinking about how you can apply AI because yeah. you know the SaaS model has been around for a long time and, yeah. and there's, there's some good parts of it and there's some not so good parts of it, particularly, you know, people, there's a backlash on SaaS pricing and, you know, the model's sort of fossilized. and so. It's interesting to, to hear them talk about how they can use the platforms like Neo4j and AI and GraphRag to rethink how they approach workflows. And so this is what I wanted yeah. to get to because I think you know RAG is really interesting. GraphRag is even more interesting, but it's still early days. And, and now we're talking about agents, this whole yeah. notion of agentic. And to the extent that you have harmonized data and it's governed and it's secure, um, Going beyond a single co-pilot or a single agent starts to be, get really interesting where you can imagine multiple agents working in concert. You've got harmonized data, you've got a, maybe an agent control framework, which probably is not your swim lane, but maybe you touch upon it. And now you're sort of doing things that you necessarily can't do with microservices, which are largely hard-coded and somewhat yeah. fragile. Yeah. So this is a new world we're entering. I don't yeah. know what inning we're in, but it's yeah. not the ninth. Yeah. It's very early. Yeah. So how do you see this whole thing playing out? What's Neo4j's role? Yeah, so I, I, I guess starting, going back to where you started around, like SaaS, build versus buy. Actually, we, we have a lot of customers using Neo4j inside of their SaaS applications. Mm -hmm. And ideally, like this is how certainly the longer tail of mid-market and smaller companies, most of their software is off the shelf. Most of our software is off the shelf. We don't, you know, we, we build our own systems only when we absolutely have to, other than our core product, of course. Right. Um, but then large enterprises oftentimes have very bespoke requirements, which is why they build, build their own, where Neo4j is also used. So we, we love selling to both and, uh, you know, supporting both. Um, and ultimately it's each company's decision, you know, is to, for what they're trying to do, do they build, do they buy, we're, we're, we're very happy with with both. Um, on the uh, on the agent side, yeah, this is the next big thing for sure. And you're right, agentic workflows themselves are forms of graphs. And you can see the begins, beginnings of this with like Langchain and Langgraph, where you have basic orchestration frameworks. Uh, we have been having 
some conversations, again, we're not here yet, but this is maybe an inning or two ahead, about the need for control graphs in more complex applications where you have many agents and you need the application to, you know, uh, and then and the framework itself to be able to orchestrate between what the agents are doing and saying. Um, but more, you know, the, the thing that's happening now is inside of many of these agents, you have, you know, small models, large models, vector-based RAG, also graph RAG in some, some might be a call just to an LLM. Some of the workflows we've seen where LLMs are generating Cypher in order to be able to engage with a graph based on a human language question. Um, then using another LLM to do like a two or three shot. Okay, let's see if an error comes back. And if it does, let's validate that. And so there, there's, uh, you know, this idea of ping ponging between different models and different agents is, uh, is really compelling. Yeah, it sure is. And by the way, I, I'm not by any means predicting the death of SaaS. I, I actually think the reverse. I think the existing SaaS yeah. companies have a huge opportunity I agree. because they yeah. own the business logic, they have the data, they have the metadata, and to the extent that they can connect all that together, which is non-trivial. Yeah. I do think there's two vectors, and I'd be interested in your opinion on this. I think there's the existing SaaS platforms, the great SaaS platforms, ServiceNow, Salesforce, Workday, Oracle, et cetera, um, SAP, they're not going anywhere. And they've got great opportunities within their own domains. I think there's other opportunities, there's really three vectors, other opportunities to connect to those backend systems, yeah. use products like platforms like Neo4j to harmonize that data and then really empower those agents. And I think there's a third vector, which is startups that say, hey, we're going to completely reimagine the software stack. Yeah. And, and I think all three are viable. I think all three, it's not, a, it's not a winner take all. I think it's going to be, I think the market's big enough to support those three. So my question is, how do you support each of those? I think you're in a yeah. good position to do so. Yeah, and I mean, what, part of what you're describing, like pattern number two, where a SaaS company yeah. ties into like an existing company with data, which is part, part of what Klarna is doing. Actually, it brings them tighter in with the ecosystem of their different SaaS vendors, that this is, uh, you know, it's another way in which the world is becoming more connected and there are more touch points between things, which actually accelerates the, the need in the case for graph. Um, we, so I've seen a pattern, a single pattern that actually describes those three, which is, uh, so I, I think of it as graphs are eating the world, <laughs> much like you know the well-known Mark Andreessen software is eating the world, sure. which continues to be true, right? More in a SaaS form these days. AI is now eating the world. But the way in which graphs are eating the world is this, is for any data-driven human activity, so let's call that a use case, you can only get so good with just surface data about the inner connectivity of the system. Um, of a given system or how it connects to other systems. So systems of biology is how they relate to systems of people and buyers and doctors and providers and so on and so forth, or systems of payments in relation to products, banking products that customers own and FinTech and um, so on and so forth. And uh, so, so there's like an S-curve, everything moves in S-curves um, when it looks <laughs> you know, life's an S curve, I right? Agree. Right, life's an S curve. <laughs> um, so, most use cases are at some S curve where they're not using connected data and so they're topping out. Um, and so, time and again, my journey at Neo4j has been seeing at least one new, case, use, new use case every week for over 10 years where someone's discovered some new way to use um, the deeper connectivity two, three levels out or more inside their existing application or inside their existing predictive analytics um, or forensics to do better. So then it's then there's another S-curve that starts. So either existing companies disrupt their own products by just adding on Neo4j along, along to the side, you know, add graphs to your existing use case alongside existing systems, then it gets better, then it gets harder for their competitors to compete, the competitors have to level up. Or you have new companies come into being initially as startups and then they get bigger and then they become kind of fast growing mid-market SaaS companies, which then start 
pulling business away or cre creating their own new use cases. But this is all kind of the same graph phenomenon as far as we're concerned. I, 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 I want to have you back and, and go deeper into this because you're opening up now so many other potential areas of conversation. You know, large language models, small language models, uh, data that's sort of hidden inside of corporations now that you can connect to. Um, we like to say that large language models and small language models are going to turn to LAMs and SAMs, large action models and mm. small yeah. action models, where, again, you can't hard code everything, but yeah. these agents can observe what we're doing and you guys can, can create, observe and create those uh, connections, or I guess take advantage of what the agents are observing and then store those connections and There's then you reuse There's definitely them. a feedback loop. And we're seeing that with customers already where they'll take the actions at different levels, like the end action that was taken, the action that was taken by an individual agent, and then even the action taken by a given query, feed that into the system, store it, and then use that to improve things. And you can do that through GraphRag. You could also by use, do it by using the graph to train the model. Um, uh, so lots, lots of different Training, fine tuning. Uh, yeah. I, I would, really would love to have you back. We're out of time, but uh, Philip, thanks so much for it's been coming pleasure. on theCUBE. And really. hey, keep it right there. We got more action high above courtside, as they say, from NYSE, theCUBE plus NYSE Wired. I'm Dave Vellante. We'll be right back.